Welcome everyone to The Wire, or more specifically, Firewire Australia. Raz! Yeah. Say hello! Hello! Give me a yee! This video shows Mark Price in conversation with an auditorium full of about 100 students at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. It's a discussion on what the surfboard industry is, how the surfboard industry works, and the ways that the surfboard industry is changing. I think you'll find it a very fascinating conversation. The video is a little bit fuzzy, but the audio is tack sharp, and these students ask a lot of really good questions at the end, so we are releasing it. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, and thanks for coming. We're going to start with a video, which may be a little cliché, but it does have relevance to what we're going to talk about. It's never a bad thing to pay tribute to Kelly Slater, who most of you know is the 11-time world champion, but perhaps more importantly, he's surfing an eco-board as certified by Sustainable Surf. And as we talk about the industry, I'll make mention of the fact that you often hear from professional surfing that eco-boards don't have the performance levels of regular boards or more toxic surfboards. So there's a lot of myth out there as to what an eco board is and what it's capable of doing. So just a short video to show you Kelly at Cloud surfing an eco board and the way in which he's approaching the wave and the boards reacting is, is incredible. I think it's some of the best footage that I've ever seen and certainly worthy of a, of a look-see. So three minute video and then we'll jump into the presentation itself. Thanks.
when you look around the marketplace in surfboards, there's actually not a lot of sustainable surfboards out there. And there's many reasons for that. So we're going to look at the factors that are contributing to the relatively slow pace of adoption. There's a tremendous amount of awareness when you talk to surfers about the environment, if for no other reason than we play in it most days. But it's not really translating into action. So that's going to be sort of the, the basic premise that we're going to talk about. However, when you talk about sustainability from a company perspective, it's also important to have a point of view as to how you view climate change and where the world's headed, because that's going to determine how aggressively you go after more sustainable business practices. So I'm going to talk briefly about the big picture, how we see the world and where it's headed. And if we want to dig into that stuff in more detail in the Q&A, by all means. Uh, so to start, let me see if I get all this stuff working right. So clearly we live on a finite planet. You know, it's not getting any bigger and we have to use the resources that are available to us. And the myth of exponential growth, this is a really important point because when you talk to economists or you listen to economists, they always talk about how we need X percent compounded growth every year for the whole global economy to work. And they'll say we need three or four or five percent. And in math, there's this concept of the rule of 72. And the way it works is whenever you want to figure out how long it's going to take for something to double, you take the compounded growth rate and divide it into 72. So let's say an economist says, hey, we're going to grow the global economy at 5% into the future, and that's how we're going to have relatively high levels of employment, you know, stable societies, blah, blah, blah. If you divide 5 into 72, and I think it's 18, that means in 18 years, whatever you're measuring will double. It could be your stock portfolio, but in this particular case, it's the global economy. So if you look at the size of the global economy today, where are we going to get the resources, the purchasing power, the disposal facilities to deal with twice the amount of economic activity that's going on today? So exponential growth compounded into infinity is just unattainable. It's not possible. And I think it's really important for us as a society to get our heads around the fact that these economic models are simply not going to work over the long term. Staying in business. You know, if you want to do good things from a company perspective, you have to stay in business. So part of sustainability for us is having a healthy bottom line so we can stay in business and continue, continue to do the things we want to do. Climate change. We think it's real. We think it's an existential threat. Now, that word gets thrown around a lot, but if you really drill into it, it means your, re your existence is under threat. So we see it as a, an issue that will literally end the world as we know it, if left completely unaddressed. So when you start thinking of things in those terms, then you get pretty serious about the things you want to do to try and address them. And we think also that we need a new definition of capitalism. You know, people always talk about capitalism as the engine of economic growth. And it is quite literally an engine. It requires inputs, and it has exhausts, and it creates forward movement. So you've got label, labor, capital, and raw materials coming in the front end. It's creating goods and services. And part of the exhaust is people, never mind uh, raw materials and other waste that go into the whole process. So we have to rethink this engine. How does it, what does it run on? What's it doing? And how is the waste dealt with? So when you put all these things together, we're facing a pretty uphill battle as to how we may affect change in the world. And when you start translating that into your company, as I mentioned, you are willing to take some pretty drastic action to try and affect a better world. So that's sort of like the big picture, just to tee up how serious we are in trying to build less toxic surfboards and operate our business in a less toxic way. Now, that said, we got miles to go. I mean, cradle to cradle is obviously the holy grail. We're not even close. We're building less toxic surfboards. They're not toxin-free. So I don't want to get on a pedestal here and say we've got it all figured out and we're doing everything right. But we are doing certainly a lot more than most people in our industry, and hopefully through that, we're coercing and encouraging them to make similar changes. So drilling into the actual case study, let's, our ethos is based around two things. We always remember that we are a surfboard company, so we're basically making sporting goods, which means there has to be a, a performance level that's on a par with the product that's out there. Nobody's going to pay a premium or accept lesser performance for a piece of sporting good that's less toxic. It has to meet similar price points and performance characteristics as what's already out there, but do it in a more sustainable way. So we always remember 
that we're building surfboards and we want to have less toxicity but maintain performance and comparable price points. But we also believe that we have to give back something along the way. And that means support for organizations like Sustainable Surf, the Surf Rider Foundation, um, Surf Aid, Surfers Against Sewage. There's quite a long list of environmental and humanitarian organizations that we support. So much so that in 2015, we actually gave away 5% of our net profit uh, towards those organizations. But again, it's not pure altruism, because we believe that the companies of the future that are going to succeed need to operate under these principles. It's just that the reward is going to come later, and we're prepared to take that longer view, which is a fairly you know, unique position to be in. Most companies are watching their bottom line on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter or year-on-year -year basis. They're answerable to shareholders who want a short-term return on whatever investments they've made. We are not in that situation. We were fortunate when the company was founded to have a long-term view, and with Kelly's recent investment in our company, we have an even longer-term view than we had prior. So we do recognize that we're in a pretty unique situation. So why has the adoption of less toxic materials taken so long? You know, what's holding back the obvious? And there's a number of reasons for that. So we're going to look into those and drill into it in some detail. So surfboards are relatively inexpensive to make in the sense that, you know, you can build them in your garage. You don't need a giant factory to, to build a surfboard. So there's a lot of people in the surfboard space. It's an incredibly fragmented market. There's probably seven or 800 companies that make surfboards around the world. There certainly aren't seven to 800 tennis racket companies or automobile companies or soda companies. So it's a very fragmented market. CAD software has enabled average shapers to design really great surfboards. Because if you understand the design principles behind a surfboard, you don't need the manual dexterity to be able to use a planer with CAD software. You can get a CNC machine to cut it. So it opens the door for a wide range of people to get involved in surfboard design. So surfboard design has been pushed really far. If you look at surfboards today versus 10, even 10 years ago, never mind 20 or 30 years ago, the shapes have changed dramatically. And that's because it's relatively easy to design surfboards. So that part of the surfboard business model has really grown in leaps and bounds. And you can go to third-party glass shops. You don't even need a factory. You can outsource the, the manufacture of your board. So you could design it on a CAD computer in your home. You can get a cut at a machine shop that runs CNC machines. And you can get it glassed at a third-party factory if you wanted to make a surfboard. And the other issue is, Pro-surfing has really held back the adoption of green materials. 90% of the pro-surfers out there ride what's called PUPE. The PU stands for polyurethane, which is the foam, and the PE is polyester, which is the resin. Incredibly toxic materials. In fact, um, acetone is used to clean up polyester resin from brushes and stir sticks and, and, and various parts of the factory, and that's a known carcinogen. So it is the most toxic materials that you can possibly work with. But we also live in an aspirational world. So when 90% of the pro surfers are riding PEPU, that holds back the adoption of green materials because younger surfers looking to them for inspiration want to ride what they ride. And so you have a highly competitive and creative design environment which has pushed the shape of surf surfboards, as I mentioned, way farther than they were even a year, five years, or 10 years ago. I touched on this a moment ago. It's a completely unique marketplace. It's incredibly fragmented. So you have six or 700 different companies making surfboards. But on top of that, you also have a high percentage of those companies selling factory direct to consumers. So we compete against companies whose retail price points to the end consumer are below our wholesale price points. There's no other sporting good equipment in the world that you can just roll up to a factory and readily buy it all over the world. So it's a, it's a weird marketplace. It's a very tough marketplace to do business in. And so there aren't really massive economies of scale because by definition, when you have a market that's so fragmented, Nobody has a giant market share, so nobody has a massive bottom line because they have the top line revenue to drive it. 
So companies are undercapitalized. And as you probably know, when you want to change things or adopt new materials, in the early stages of those changes in adoption, the costs are much higher than when the economies of scale kick in. So the business model doesn't have economies of scale. It's highly fragmented. You compete against companies selling direct to your customers without going through retail. The companies are undercapitalized. And that puts tremendous pressure on retail price points and the margins that you operate under. So your hands are tied when it comes to making investments in new materials or processes towards more greener outcomes. And this is the, this is the big one. You know, if you talk to surfboard builders, they, they'll always tell you that surfboards are too cheap. Given the amount of work that goes into them, it takes decades to become a brilliant shaper. It takes a long time to learn how to sand a board properly or laminate it. So there's a lot of skill involved in building surfboards. There's a lot of time involved. So they'll say that surfboards are too cheap. I would argue the opposite. I think surfboards are worth what the consumer is willing to pay for them, and that's the price-to-value equation. And that's true in any marketplace. And the surfboard industry has been building disposable surfboards for decades. A regular PU, PE surfboard, after three or four or six months, the materials have fatigued, the deck is dented, the resale value is nothing. You'll be lucky to get 200 bucks for it at a garage sale. So I think the industry needs to look itself in the face and go, hang on a minute, we have created a price-to-value equation that has driven down the price of the modern surfboard to a level that compresses margins because that's all they're worth. You know, when you buy a BMW, it does cost more on the front end, but the resale value is that much higher. So there's a much higher price-to-value equation than buying a much cheaper car. Now, granted, you have to have the money to afford the BMW, but we're not talking about the difference between $800 today and $1,500. You know, a couple hundred dollars extra on the retail price point would drive up margins. It would create opportunity for companies to adopt new materials and factory processes that green technologies demand. And so we're kind of in this box. And this happened with Firewire. When we first launched, our boards were $750 in the US at a time when the average price point of our competitors was $625. And we were trying to build our boards domestically because we wanted to. And they didn't sell because there was this sort of psychological $700 price point ceiling back then that the customers were just unwilling to pay. And their perception was, that that's all that surfboards are worth. So there's a lot of stuff that's gonna to have to change in the business model in order for greener surfboards to really come to fruition across the market in general. So the way forward is to build better products. And what that'll do is break us out of this box where the consumer only believes that a surfboard is worth X. And we need to convince the consumer that if the surfboard is now worth X plus. And literally you have to build better surfboards. And if you do, you'll be amazed how much support you get. So TimberTech was a concept that was brought to us about four years ago. We just loved the look of it. It was consistent with our ethos around sustainability, but we had no idea as to what the market adoption would be. So we put it out there, and it's 30% of our sales, and it has maintained that 30% threshold over the last few years, despite the growth in our business. So it's maintaining itself as a percentage of our business and obviously increased units sold. And we sell quite a lot of surfboards. We are one of the bigger companies in the market. So it was a great lesson for us that if you do the right thing and you put it out there, people will support it. Now, we put it out there at the same price point as existing surfboards, and we absorbed the cost of bioresins and the sust sustainably grown timber that's used as the deck skins and the 20% recycled EPS core that's in the, in the uh, TimberTech build. But again, you know, we're looking long term. And I think that everyone needs to start having a much longer term view of the world. I heard this comment that applied to something else, but I'll use it in this context, the eternal now. And I think it's a great phrase to describe how many people live their lives. We don't have a real sense of history and we don't have a real sense of where we're going. We're sort of living in the now. And the now is not looking very good if you extrapolate out in the future. So I think we've got to break out of that mindset. We've got to start looking at this planet from a long-term perspective, and a really long-term perspective. That's Rob Machado on his TimberTech board way back in the barrel. And there's other aspects to surfboard production. There's the packaging. So for example, we used to package our boards in bubble pack and cardboard. It cost us $1.68 per board, and when the packaging was removed, it ended up in the trash. 
So we switched to the BAST packaging system, which we co-developed with the surfer out of San Diego, who just had had enough of all this bubble pack and cardboard going to waste. It's five times more expensive than the $1.68. It costs us over $6 per board. Now, that extra five bucks and some change may not sound a lot, but when you're working in a tough margin business and you're building quite a lot of surfboards, that's straight off the bottom line, and that's a commitment you have to be willing to make. But again, coming back to our ethos, you've got to do things like that if you want to affect change. So the BAS system is 100% molded pulp. It's biodegradable. It's reusable. It's recyclable. It's clearly a better mousetrap. And there were some interesting knock-on effects because when our surfboards used to arrive at, say, one of our retailers' warehouses, packed in bubble pack, cardboard, and packing tape, they would have to use blades to cut the boards out of the packaging. And invariably, with 50 boards arriving, one or two of them would get nicked with a blade and it would become a second. And with the bass packaging, where you're using Velcro straps to attach and remove, remove the packaging, the time to remove the boards from the packaging is reduced tremendously and you're not getting any damage to the boards in the process. Radical innovation on the product side. This is a traction concept that we developed this year uh, with Bloom Foam, where they're literally taking the algae that grows, the toxic algae that grows on rivers and lakes. And I think you're all probably familiar with, ha with what happened in Florida recently and still is ongoing. So this company goes in and scrapes the algae off the top of the water. They desiccate it, pulverize it, and extrude it into an a EVA substitute, which has incredible traction uh, uh, characteristics to it. And we very successively, successfully introduced uh, traction pads made out of this uh, algae-based uh, foam. And I think Kelly's comment here, I'll just give you a chance to read it, sums up perfectly the way companies need to think about product development and the types of materials that they use in the process. So just to give you some data around how we operate and the things that we, we are actually doing. So since 2004, every single surfboard we build is EcoBoard certified. We're the only global company that's doing that. There's definitely smaller regional companies operating in markets that are meeting or even exceeding the things that we're doing. But as far as commercially sold surfboards at retail around the world, we're the only company that are 100% EcoBoard certified. We're recycling all of our EPS waste. Now, this is an, an amazing process, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in the moment because there's some imagery, imagery around that. The best eco packaging I mentioned to you, zero acetone in our factory. The people that work in our factory every day do wear masks, but when I go there, I never wear a mask, even in the laminating room, in the sanding rooms, or anywhere. And when you stop using toxic materials to build your product, obviously the overall toxicity of the factory itself is completely changed. And as I mentioned, acetone is an is a incredibly dangerous uh, liquid. It can be absorbed through your skin and obviously through breathing. And it's prevalent throughout the polyester surfboard industry. You'll see guys washing their hands with acetone after laminating surfboards. I mean, it's insane. So our surfboards emit 50 times less VOCs during manufacture and over the life of the surfboard versus PU polyester surfboards, and that's going to go up even more as we adopt new and ever greener materials. But that's quite a telling statistic right there. We're also ISO 9000 certified. Now, that's not really an environmental standard. It's a quality control standard, which means you're creating systems and processes that create repetitive, consistent outcomes. But it goes hand in hand, because if you want to operate your business with integrity, your quality is as much a part as the sustainability initiative as the materials that you use. And we're also pursuing uh, environmental management uh, certifications, carbon neutrality, zero waste by 2020 or sooner, and we're exploring solar power. The only holdback there is uh, working with our landlord to make sure that we can extend our lease on favorable terms because once you install solar, the payback period is you know, quite long. And fair trade certification, which is probably unheard of in the surfboard industry, and we should have that by the end of 2018. So this is the uh, EPS um, 
recycled process. And what happens is there's a piece of equipment called a densifier. And what it does is it reduces the volume of EPS dust 100 times. So if you had enough EPS dust to fill this room, you could compress it to 100 times its size. And in the process, you get an incredibly dense, durable material. So we're making paving stones out of the densified EPS. And that's an example of an area outside our factory where we've set up the paving stones. And we're going to be supplying them just to local villages in Thailand where we operate free of charge. Uh, Starboards, which is one of the big SUP companies in the world, is building their new headquarters. And they're going to be using these pavers uh, in their garden. And Kelly's Wave Company is going to be using them up in Lemoore, where his, his wave company is located. But it's just a perfect example of something that was complete waste can be turned into a useful uh, product. And we're also going to be building uh, fence posts and cinder blocks uh, out of it because it's very dense and incredibly durable. And then here's an example of a TimberTech surfboard. So it's this surfboard here, but built from all the offcuts from building that surfboard. So we're basically piecing together the deck skin from all the offcut wood to create uh, an even more sustainable version of the TimberTech surfboard that you see on my right. Now here's some interesting metrics. So Kevin talked about the Sustainable Surf Project, which has been fantastic. What they have basically done, like LEED certification, they've created a brand. And consumers now know what an eco board is, and in many cases they're going into stores and actually asking for an eco board certified from whatever brand they like to ride. And you'll see that whether it's through reductions in bioresin or recycled foams, you're reducing the carbon footprint of the surfboard dramatically. And there's quite a significant reduction in the toxicity associated with eco board manufacture versus traditional boards. And this one, I think, is actually even more interesting because, look, we build our boards offshore. We tried to build our boards in San Diego and Burley Heads, Australia, and quite honestly, we lost our asses because we got boxed in by that business model where consumers weren't willing to pay the 750 bucks. Our costs of manufacture were much higher than our competitors. We had no margin, so we had to go offshore or go out of business. And so one of the big knocks against us is you spewing all this carbon, shipping your boards from Thailand to Long Beach. Uh, but if you look at this metrics, if you send a board from Asia to California on a container ship, you're going to put out 2.9 pounds of CO2. But if you ship a board from Southern California to NorCal, it's almost the same at 2.4. So there's a lot of things that need to go into the discussion around sustainability and how to pr approach building your products. Uh, Patagonia went through this years ago. When they decided to go offshore, they were really concerned about what it meant for the toxicity of their supply chain. And they did an LCA study like this. And the results showed that less than 2% of the carbon uh, emitted was through the transportation from Asia to the US. And it's just an interesting statistic uh, when you start dealing with facts versus opinions. So here's a reality check on what needs to happen next. We've got to have serious and sustained consumer education. And I'm not just talking about the, less, the reduced toxicity of a surfboard. People really need to get their act together on what climate change means, ocean acidification, all the things associated with it, with it. Because once you start understanding what's going on, it's pretty hard to ignore it. We need real leadership from the pro-surfing community. Kelly's starting to set the pace. Obviously, Michelle Berez and Stu Kennedy, who ride for us, are also riding eco boards, as is Rob Machado. But we need our competitors to start building them. We need the pro surfing establishment to start adopting these initiatives, which is going to have a much bigger effect on the global surfboard market than we ever could have. It's going to cost margin in the short run. There's just no way around that. But I think companies need to realize we believe that at some point in the future, we don't know when, but at some point in the future, if you're not operating your business in the most sustainable way possible, consumers will reject your products, all other things being equal. So not only is climate change an existential threat to us as people, we believe it's an existential threat to our business if we don't do these things. And if you start understanding that, whatever the cost to your margin is today compared to what it's going to cost you down the road, you do the math. The products are out there. There's cloth alternatives, there's bioresins, there's eco-packaging, there's more sustainable foam alternatives. It's all there, and there's more to come. So it's not like you have to break ground and pioneer stuff and go down dead ends. 
The work's being done to get to EcoBoard certification. Now, we need to go beyond that in the long term. But to, we could all be there today with every surfboard we ride without any loss of performance. I mean, we really believe that. And we need to reset the consumer expectations. And that comes back to that price-to-value equation. We need to build better products without sacrificing performance or charging an arm and a leg. And over time, we'll be able to raise the price points to a more sustainable business model for the industry as a whole as people realize that the product they're buying is more sustainable, the performance is equal, and it's going to last longer. And they will be willing to pay a modest premium as a result. But there's a lot of duty now for the future that is required to move our industry in that direction. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Thank you. Do you ever see the WSL, the World Surf League, uh, requiring professional surfers to compete with eco boards? Because I see John John goes out and he'll break like four boards in one session, and that just becomes the, the PU, you know, these toxic chemicals yeah. wind up in the landfill after one sesh. Um, and additionally, uh, seeing all the best surfers in the world supporting these eco boards might help dispel this kind of. Uh, connotation that they don't perform as well as traditional boards? Look, there's been discussions within the WSL about doing just that, and they've decided to just take it a little bit slower. They definitely are concerned about it. In fact, there's this um, aspect to the WSL called PURE, and what they do is they give grants to scientists working on climate change issues. They're trying to run their events with you know, carbon offsets. There's definitely a, an environmental consciousness within the WSL. In fact, the guy who's underwriting it and his family are very involved in vi environmental causes. But they're going to take it a little bit slowly. And I think they will get there. Uh, but I don't necessarily see a Formula One type situation where they just go in and mandate that. And part of the reason is it is difficult, as I mentioned, because the business model is so tough. And to force companies to take on added costs when they aren't able to raise their prices to the consumer is quite a big ask. Um, so we'll have to see how it goes. Uh, but I, I, I'm not going to throw WSL under the bus. A, they have certainly saved professional surfing. I think it was going to just slowly die on the vine uh, without their support. And I know that the people behind the scenes there have a real strong commitment to the environment. They're just trying to figure out exactly how they want to roll it out. Sweet. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm the president of the LMU Surf Club. And I just had a question, um, or it's kind of a comment. Um, listening to this presentation, it kind of makes me feel like you guys are like the Tesla of the surfboard company. And you guys know that Tesla is mainly an energy company, and they ended up producing a line of cars. Could you see Firewire potentially merging or partnering with other companies to expand your portfolio in producing something other than surfboards and maybe trying to push that kind of environmental activism in any way? Or are you guys currently pursuing that? Well, it's interesting you should say that because Tesla approached us to do a collab surfboard, uh, but we decided against it for, for various reasons. You know, when people ask, you know, what is Firewire? I would say we're a technology company that happens to make surfboards. And what we mean by that is we feel the market is overtraded. We're not going to introduce products into the market unless they have a sustainability component or we can exceed the performance standards that are already out there. So, and we're also committed to surf hard goods. I think companies need, companies need discipline in this marketplace in order to go forward. Too many people create a brand and start slapping their logo on an array of products because they have quote unquote market permission to create stuff. So we're very disciplined. That's not to say we wouldn't collaborate with another company, but we're, our mission is to build the best, less toxic surfboard products that we can and related hard goods accessories. So you could see things like leashes and tractions and board bags and things like that in our future, but I don't see us going beyond the core surf market because quite honestly, that's where our passion lies. And I don't really want to make stuff because we can, no matter how sustainable it may be. It's got to fit with what we really, really care about. Uh, given the potential profit margin cuts, uh, what do the you think it's The potential for what, sorry? The potential for like a smaller profit margin with these eco yeah. boards. What do you think it's going to take to convince other companies to get behind this as much as Fireware has? I think we just have to continue to succeed in the marketplace. 
you know, I, I've heard an anecdotal story that a lot of our competitors are pissed off at us because their customers, you know, if you ride a CI surfboard, you probably wedded to that brand. You probably have ridden those boards for years and, and they make fantastic surfboards. And the same could be said for JS and Lost and DH and, and all the major brands. But a lot of their customers are now coming into retail stores saying, hey, I want a CI eco board. And so I think what we can do is just have as much success in the market as we can, push our sustainability initiatives as far as we possibly can, and thereby put pressure on our competitors to follow us because um, they're going to lose market share if they don't. That's all we can do. And it seems to be working, though. So we're going to continue doing it. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Good presentation. Could you quickly uh, describe the, the key materials that you put into your boards and how you make them? Sure. So most of our cores are EPS uh, foam, which is expanded polystyrene foam. Uh, the Timbertech boards have a 20% recycled content in that foam. The FST and LFT, which are the two other technologies, are 100% virgin uh, EPS foam. We use bioresin throughout. At this point in time, we use regular cloth in the lamination process, but we are about eight months away from introducing a completely sustainably produced cloth alternative that's not hemp or flax or linen or any of the things that anybody is familiar with. It's going to be quite mind-blowing where this product comes from and the way in which it's incorporated into the process. And then when it comes to fin boxes, we're working with future fins on using, on, in creating recycled content fin boxes and less toxic fins. Uh, but outside of the bioresin and in the case of TimberTech, the sustainably grown um, Polonia deck skins, we use a lot of the products that our competitors do. When, when you say bio, um, the bioresins, what, what are they coming from? Uh, we use SuperSap from Entropy Resins. Uh, there's two versions. There's a, tw a, I think it's around a 17 or 18 percent bio content, and then there's a 35 percent bio content. The 35 percent has a slight yellow tinge to it, so we use it on the TimberTech boards because with the wood substrate you don't notice it. But on the white boards we use, I think it's a 17 or 18 percent uh, bio content SuperSap from Entropy. I would mention, though, because they do have a new product coming out, which is quite interesting, and this gives you an idea of where things are going. So they have developed, uh, in uh, partnership with a major electronics company, a recyclable resin. So basically, you can uncure the resin. You can literally peel the cloth off your board, dip it in a warm vinegar uh, liquid, and it will separate out the resin from the cloth. You can then take out the cloth and reuse it, and you, the resin can then be siphoned off from the vinegar and extruded into other po uh, parts like fin boxes and fins. We're a long way away from recycling surfboards because surfboards, unfortunately, are shipped based on dimensional weight, not their physical weight. That's why it costs 100 bucks to ship a surfboard to the East Coast, even though it only weighs eight pounds, you know, fully packaged. Uh, but the being able to uncure the resin is a huge step in that direction. And then in our case, where we're building boards at scale, the savings from stir sticks and brushes and buckets and things like that, because we can reuse them, is tens of thousands of dollars a year. So it's a very exciting product, and we're going to be incorporating it later this year. And then in 2018, it's going to be available industry-wide. How, how big is the market overall? That's a really tough question because uh, all the surfboard companies are private. So based on the best analysis that we can get, and that's, this is based on talking to the fin companies who supply fin boxes, and FCS and Futures probably have about 85 to 90 percent market share, so their sales are probably a fairly good indication of the number of surfboards built. And we would place it at somewhere between 500 and 700,000 a year. But there's a lot of misinformation out there. For example, there's a study that came out of London that said that there's 28 million surfers in the world. And if you go down and read the footnotes, they define a surfer as someone who surfs at least once a year. It's a meaningless statistic. But I think that seven to 800,000 is certainly in the ballpark in terms of the number of surfboards built. Is that a $500 million market share? Yeah, let's take an ASP of uh, a retail of probably $600. So close enough, yeah. Um, how do you think hydrofoil boards will affect the market in the future? 
Uh, I think it's a, it'll be a niche for a couple reasons. Excuse me. They're incredibly dangerous. So I think at some point, as they get adopted to a greater degree, they may be confined to certain beaches, like jet skis are, for example. You can't just run a jet ski th through the lineup at Malibu. Um, and at least as it stands today, the uh, performance levels, fun is all hell. I mean, it, it, I'd love to try it, and it looks brilliant. But it is somewhat limiting when you get into more challenging wave conditions, and I think it's, it's going to require an incredible level of skill to use them success successfully. So between that component and the danger factor, I think that it has a place. Um, where I think the real innovation is going to come next is in fins that create lift without going to full-blown hydrofoil status. And I think that's where there's going to be a tremendous amount of innovation going forward. It's, it's one of the, I wouldn't say the last frontiers, but certainly an untapped frontier in surfboard design is, is fins. And then that'll in, in turn re come back around and change surfboard design to you know, work in conjunction with those new fin technologies. There's a lot more stuff to be done on the design side. How does uh, like Firewire and like all these eco surfboard companies project sustainable growth? Because I know you said that to change consumer perception, you'd need to eat more of the margin and lower the surfboard cost. But is that really a sustainable growth model? Because eventually, like you said, you will need to raise the surfboard price to something that's higher than the PUPE boards. Yeah, I th well, I think you you got to look at the short term problem and the longer term solution. So the short term problem is what you described, where we've got tough margins and we have to build better product within those margin constraints. But longer term, if you build better product, you're going to be able to raise the price because the consumer will perceive it to be worth more and it be of more value to them. So we feel that down the road, surfboards will be more expensive, but they will be worth it. Like, what, what distinguishing factors will make it a better board just other than for being better for the environment, though? Durability. That's the number one issue. You know, performance levels are going to increase incrementally. I don't think there's going to be exponential improvements in performance. But durability is a huge issue. I mean, anyone who's owned a PU surfboard for any length of time knows how quickly they delaminate, dent, and as I mentioned, have no real resale value. So we've got to build better product. I think that's true across the board. We've got to start moving, as a society, we have to start moving towards quality over quantity. Sorry, last question. Sure. But realistically, what would the life of a eco board be compared to, I know you said the PUPE boards are three to four months typically with without. Three to four months of peak performance. Mm -hmm. You know, I have boards that are five years old that we built that ha have the same liveliness and spring in their performance as the day I got them. So it's totally possible to build a better mousetrap. There's no question about it. But I do want to recognize, as I mentioned in the presentation, that there are financial constraints, and not all surfboard companies have the resources we do or the will, because you need both. You can't just have the will and not the resources to do what we're doing. But there are others that could do what we're doing and aren't. So there's certainly some more leadership that's required. But I'll be the first to acknowledge that there's a lot of surfboard companies that are just hanging on, and they really aren't going to be able to pull this off. Thanks. I had two questions. One was you said you classify your company as kind of a technology company that right. deals in surfboards. And I was wondering, could you just say a little bit about the kind of the cost and the efforts in terms of employees in developing the technology? Well, we were fortunate that the original technology was developed by you know, the quintessential backyard tinkerer, a guy in Western Australia who just decided that surfboards could be built better. And he literally built them in his garage for years, perfecting them, trying new materials and getting the recipe right. So he approached us uh, 11 years ago, and we worked out a deal where we literally bought that technology. The problem was he only knew how to build five a week. So the real investment that we made was figuring out how to scale that technology to your point and the investments required to do that, which were quite considerable. We, went to, we never wanted to be in the manufacturing business. You know, all of, none of us came from the surfboard industry, but we knew enough about it to realize that it's really hard to make surfboards. So we went to a lot of the major manufacturers around the world and we showed them the board and said, listen, here it is. Can, would you be interested in partnering with us to build them? They all refused. Too complicated, too hard, 
don't want to do it, forget it, it's not going to work, blah, blah, blah. So we were forced to set up our own supply chain. We were forced to literally rent a vacant building, start training people. It took us years to scale the business successfully at considerable cost. So to your point, there were a lot of investments made on the front end. And the processes that we use, the way in which we see in CI boards, the vacuum processes that we use to build the blanks, you know, a traditional surfboard with a wood center stringer, you can buy a blank from a blank manufacturer that has a bit of a rocker in it. It probably has a semblance of an outline in it, in it on it, and uh, you then shape it from there. We have nine steps just to build out blank before it even goes on the CNC machine. So it's a completely different way of building surfboards, but the results, I think, speak for themselves. If we had entered the market with even if Kelly was part of our business back then, and we had entered the market with the same type of product as our competitors, just with a different logo on it, I don't think we would have had the success that we're having today. And I had a follow-up question um, with, you know, that you've made the choice to go to Thailand for a lot of this. Yeah. Um, is there anything that could happen either in the price point or in um, future directions that would motivate you to come back to production in the U.S., or is that kind of... Um, something you're not looking at? Uh, look, it's a good question, and, and we have a considerable, considerable investment in Thailand. We had to. You know, we had to go there in the first place, and then obviously as we had success, we had to scale the business over there. That said, we have long lead times. Uh, there's always the potential for disruption when you have a supply chain on the other side of the world. There's political uh, potential in Thailand. It's quite a volatile country from a political perspective. Our factory was actually closed down for two months from monsoon flooding, so it's not without risk. We would love to build boards domestically, but the price points would have to go up quite significantly if, in order for us to have a business model that would support the company. And I think it, you know, that holds true for most sporting goods. I mean, there's a reason as product has become more technical, it's gone to lower labor cost locations. And, the consumer has benefited with the lower price points, but if we want to bring back manufacturing to the US, consumers are going to have to be willing to pay more for the product. And there's a lot of talk about that, but I've yet to see people willing to open up their wallets to support that. Going back to the question of uh, the size of the market itself, do you think it's growing constantly, or do you think, I mean, is your company doing something to, make sh to ensure like, the market itself will keep growing? You know, that's a really good question because in that same report from London that I quoted earlier, they said surfing is growing at a 20% compounded growth rate over the next five years. We don't see that. I think that uh, there's a lot of people starting surfing. If you look at attendance at surf schools, it's through the roof. But it's also a tough sport, and I think the drop, no one really factors in the drop-off rate. So when we look at the market outside of Latin America, because demographically and with the superstar athletes in surfing that they now have, surfing is blowing up in Latin America. So let's just put them off to the side. But in all the other major markets, we see it as a kind of a zero-sum game. You know, if we're going to grow, unfortunately, it's going to come from market share from our competitors, which makes it an even tougher market. <clears throat> so uh, for those of us in the room, and I have a feeling it's um, the, the minority, who aren't even within the sphere of the surf world, you know, they're not really familiar, they don't surf, what, what can a layperson do to support this, you know, that shares the company ethos of sustainability and using sustainable products, what can they do to help the growth of this kind of manufacturing that's sustainably minded? Well, I think you just need to pay more attention to the business practices of the companies that you support. I mean, there's, there's fire wires in every industry, and I think you've got to seek those companies out and support them, because we need a sea change in how we design product, how we build it, how we manufacture it and dispose of it, and how we use of it prior to disposal. And then, you know, in your own life, there's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, you know, we don't have trash cans in our office, for example, which forces everyone to recycle because they have to take their trash over to the recycle center. Single-use plastic bottles just have to go. It has to be stopped dead in its tracks. It's, there's no point in it. Um, you know, if you have the resources to set up veggie gardens or catchment systems off your roof, solar power. I mean, there's, there's so many things you can do. There's no one thing that's going to make it better. And quite honestly, when it comes to the really big picture, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic. But um, we were talking to our art director the other day, and he made a great analogy. He said, you know, there's, there's two, you can be one of two kinds of people in the world. You can consider the world as this giant body that we all sort of are a part of. 
And you can be a red blood cell or you can be a cancer cell. And we just choose to be a red blood cell. And, uh, and I think uh, you just got to pay attention to the way you live your life and look for those opportunities. And in doing so, hopefully influence some of the people around you. And then from there, some sort of a collective consciousness starts developing and there's a, there's a shift that needs to take place. Because if it doesn't happen, I think the future is pretty bleak. I think, you know, the, the, they say the definition of a, of a pessimist is an optimist with experience. And it's kind of how I feel most of the time. Okay, well, thanks very much for your time and I appreciate the questions. We can all uh, meet upstairs. We have uh, drinks and snacks up on the balcony up there in the life science building out the back door here. So I have a nice little like networking hour plan if you guys want to come up and meet Mark and talk to Kevin or I about either sustainable surf or sustainability on campus and how that relates to your lives and what you can do to get involved here. Come talk to us. So thank you all for coming. Right. Thank you.